Good morning, First Covenant Church, and welcome back to our Sunday service. Happy Valentine's Day, too. If this is your first time tuning in on YouTube, it is our pleasure to have you with us. For those of you joining us live this morning, a warm welcome to you as well. My name is Becca Gamboa, and I'm the worship director here. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. Please take time now to let us know that you're here by filling out a virtual connect card. Let us know your praises, your prayer requests, as our staff and elders remember you in their prayers each and every week. Where can I find that, you might ask? It's on the First Covenant Church app. Just click the connect icon at the bottom of the screen and you'll find the connect card listed there. If you don't have the app yet, follow the instructions on the screen now. Before we get into this morning's service, I have a few announcements for us. I know you must be at the edge of your seats right now. The First Covenant Church's Worship Center is where we are gathering every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. If it's been a while since you've joined us live, we would encourage you to please come. We continue to praise the Lord for his faithfulness during our own journey through the wilderness, during the months we have been adapting to the pandemic. Thank you also for your continued faithfulness to the Lord through the act of giving. Offering boxes are located throughout the church building. Besides giving of your tithes and offerings in person, you can also give through our website, the First Covenant Church app, and through the mail. Check out the following screen for more details. First Covenant Church encourages one another to be sharing our faith with others. But knowing how to approach this is often intimidating. One acronym we have used to help us in this is BLESS. This week we have made available a devotional through our church app to help you discover what it means to bless others with the good news of Jesus Christ. Check it out. This morning, we will once again read of how Moses' leadership is questioned. This time, it is not from distant corners of the camp, but from within Moses' own family. His sister Miriam and brother Aaron begin to harbor resentment and question his ability to lead the Israelites. At the very center of this passage is a question of identity. Is Moses really all that special? What kind of authority is he entitled to? Aren't we all God's chosen people? Before we begin our service this morning, I hope you will take a moment to ponder these questions in your heart. I also hope that this morning you will allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you through God's word. Thank you again for joining us today. Let's worship the Lord together. Come with me. As we continue in our time of worship this morning, I want to greet you with these words. God is love, and love is patient, it's kind, it keeps no record of wrong, it always hopes, always trusts. Love never fails. And I bring these words to you because God is love, and on this Valentine's Day, I hope that you'll remember that we can love because he first loved us. Will you sing with us our opening song, Great I Am. Sing, I want to be close. I want to be close. Close to your side, so heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one. Hallelujah, holy, holy, God almighty, how great I am. Beside thee, God Almighty, 
be near. I want to be near, near to your heart, loving the world and hating the dark. I want to see dry bones living again, singing as one. shake before him the mountains shake before him the demons run and flee at the mention of the name king of majesty there is no power in hell nor any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am the great Would you now take your Bibles and open to Psalm 30? I'd like for us, even at home, to do a responsive reading this morning so that you will engage a little bit more with what's happening on the screen in front of you. So I'll read verses uh, 1, 3, 5, all the odd verses, and I would like for you at home to responsibly read with me all of the even verses. So Psalm 30, it says, I will exalt you, Lord. For you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord, my God, I call to you for help and look to your hand. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing the praises of the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. And my heart was pure. I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I am silenced, if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, hear my heart. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you and praise you that you are, you are our king, you are our God, and Lord, that you love us. God, your love is deep, your love is high, your love is long, your love is wide. And Lord, we thank you and praise you for teaching us what it means to love you and also to love one another. Lord, that the love that we get from you, Father, the love that we receive from you, that we would share it with those around us, that we would love our neighbor as ourselves, that we would love our enemies. 
Father, would you teach us these things? And Lord, would you, now as we move into the message, Father, anoint our pastor's lips as he brings to us a message from your word, Father, that everything he speaks would be true, that it would be edifying, Lord God, and that it would glorify your name. It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Welcome and happy Valentine's Day. I hope you treat your sweetheart to something nice today. If you're joining us today for the first time, I want to say welcome and thank you for joining us. If you have been following us through this current series entitled Wilderness Transformations, then I say to you, welcome back. I'm glad that you are here with us as we continue our conversation and journey with the Israelites as they move from being slaves in Egypt to stewards in God's promised land. And this is more than a mere journey of relocation, taking two million uh, men, women, and children from point A to point B. This is, in fact, about shaping a nation. The work God does in the wilderness is designed to transform the Israelite culture. And it is accomplished through the work that God does in shaping each individual's character. God works the same way today. To this end, God cares for their needs as evidence of God's trustworthiness. And God disciplines them as means of preparation. And this God does out of God's abiding love for them. The greatest work of character development, both good and bad, I think, is influenced by our family. In fact, most of my premarital coaching work that I do with couples focuses on identifying and sharing with one another the impact of each person's family of origin. In the wilderness of transformation, God is shaping a nation for himself. And God is doing this really out of one enormous family, the descendants of Jacob. And this family is to become the stewards of God's blessing in a way that, in fact, will bless all other nations on earth. Over the last two weeks, we have been looking at God's chosen leader on the ground, a man by the name of Moses. By now, I hope you've come to realize just how difficult Moses' job really was. Yet, Moses also had a unique relationship with the Almighty God. God understands the challenges at hand for Moses and his people. And I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that Moses really had a very special relationship with the Almighty. Some might even say that Moses is God's favorite. But Moses is not leading these people alone. Last week, we learned that God instructed Moses to select 70 influential elders from among the people. God then takes a portion of the spirit residing in Moses and imparts it to these 70 elders, equipping them to lead others in obedience to the Lord. There are also Moses' siblings, Aaron and Miriam. This family... Moses, Aaron, and Miriam have played a central role in the exodus from Egypt and the formation of a nation out in the wilderness of transformation. Aaron quite literally was Moses' press secretary in the court of Pharaoh, an advocate for Moses before the elders of Israel. Aaron is the one who stands as high priest among the people, mediator between them and God. And if it weren't for Miriam, would Moses have even survived his infancy? It's Miriam who gives voice to God's deliverance following the escape through the Red Sea. These three are central in putting together kind of the first family, the leadership in the community. Generations later, the Lord speaks through the prophet Micah in calling a a disobedient people Uh, back in repentance and the lord asks oh my people what have i done to you what have i done to make you tired of me answer me for i brought you out of egypt and redeemed you from slavery i sent moses 
Aaron, and Miriam to help you. This family plays a crucial role in God's transformative work in shaping God's people. But they, too, have family drama, which, if left unchecked, could cause tremendous damage. So I invite you to turn with me to Numbers chapter 12 as we begin with verse 1. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked? Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. It is clear that jealousy, possibly fueled by racism or some other family rift, has infiltrated God's primary stewarding family. Miriam and Aaron, now more than two and a half years in the desert, have begun to question Moses' leadership among them. There is something within this family that is festering. The passage opens with Miriam and Aaron talking against Moses because of his Cushite wife. Now, Bible scholars disagree over who this is. Uh, is this Moses' wife, Zipporah? Well, she is from Midian, not the land of Cush. Some Bible scholars point to the Jewish Midrash, which states that Moses married this Cushite woman while he still served Pharaoh in Egypt. That would have made then Zipporah, his Midianite wife, his second wife. Others suggest that this is, this Cushite wife, this is Zipporah, and she is described as a Cushite because of her dark skin. Many black and Latino theologians see racism at play in this passage. And I would suggest that their observations should not be too quickly dismissed, especially in lieu of Miriam's punishment from the Lord that we'll read about in verse 10. Others suggest that this has nothing to do with ethnicity, but rather there's some family struggle going on within Moses' own family. Miriam and Aaron see that Moses' wife is taking his focus away from leading the people as he ought. Well, regardless of the root, ca root cause, uh, the text is clear. Miriam and Aaron begin to talk against their brother Moses because of his wife. We're talking about family relationships here. This is in-law kind of conversations. This is family business. And they say, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he also spoken through us? Why is it that Moses gets all the attention? What makes Moses so special? If it wasn't for us, Moses wouldn't even be here. Maybe they're thinking to themselves, perhaps the Lord doesn't know Moses the way we do. Well, this family tension has the potential to spill over into the broader community and cause even greater division among the Israelites. I believe that what makes Aaron and Miriam's grumbling so toxic is that it's rooted in their desire for power, authority, and privilege. Here, the narrator of Numbers inserts a very important disclaimer. It says, Now Moses was a very humble man. Some of the translations see, say uh, meek. Moses was a very meek man. Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. In this dysfunctional family dynamic, where questions of power, authority, and privilege are being brought to the forefront, we're told that Moses is humble. Moses is meek. In fact, the most humble man to have ever lived. Which is perhaps why God ends up speaking for Moses and not Moses himself. And the Lord wastes no time in dealing with this issue. Continuing in Numbers chapter 12, beginning with verse 4. At once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out to the tent of meeting, all three of you. So the, the three of them went out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. He stood at the entrance to the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. 
When the two of them stepped forward, he said, listen to my words. When there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. But this is not true of my servant, Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him, I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then? Were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? The anger of the Lord burned against them, and he left them. To me, it's fascinating that the Lord does not delay at all in his action. It says here that he acted at once. God immediately calls Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to the tent of meeting. God doesn't give any time for this to continue to fester. This is is not the action of an almighty king gathering his subjects for a royal decree. This is a heavenly father pulling the family minivan over to the side of the road for a little family discipline. The anger of the Lord burns against Miriam and Aaron. Their constant bickering in the back seat isn't benign. Because it is directed at God's chosen servant, Moses. His siblings aren't picking on Moses. They're questioning God's sovereignty. They are doubting the will of God. They have forgotten who Moses is. And as a result, they've forgotten who they are. They've lost sight of their true identity. They are not Israelite masters. They are stewards. Where Moses was silent, the Lord speaks powerfully and clearly. Moses is faithful in all my house, the Lord says. I choose to speak to Moses face to face, not in riddles. Moses sees me in form in a way that no other human being is allowed to do. Why? Because God has willed it to be true. The people aren't in the wilderness of transformation because of Moses. They're there in the grip of the almighty God's hand. The success or failure of the people is not Moses' burden, but the Lord's. And the Lord meets with Moses face to face because God has chosen to do so. I believe God's anger is so hot here because this family, Moses, Miriam, and Aaron, they have the opportunity to lead this community in a beautiful expression of mutuality and and spirit giftedness. But instead... Miriam and Aaron allow jealousy, resentment, and entitlement to rule in their hearts. In their desire for glory, they miss the necessity of humility. And so God disciplines them. Continuing with verse 10. When the cloud lifted from above the tent, Miriam's skin was leprous. It became as white as snow. Aaron turned toward her and saw that she had a defiling skin disease. And he said to Moses, Please, my Lord, I ask you not to hold against us the sin we have so foolishly committed. Do not let her be like a stillborn infant coming from its mother's womb with its flesh half eaten away. So Moses cried out to the Lord, Please, God, heal her. The Lord replied to Moses, If her father had spit in her face, would she not have been in disgrace for seven days? Confine her outside the camp for seven days. After that, she can be brought back. So Miriam was confined outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on until she was brought back. The punishment seems to fall on Miriam here and not Aaron, and I know that seems really unfair. (laughs) Nevertheless, when the presence of God lifts from the tent of meeting, Miriam's skin is bleached as white as snow. If the root of Miriam's resentment towards Moses was his black-skinned wife, the punishment here seems quite appropriate. The punishment, however, is not only the skin disease, but the banishment from the camp. Miriam's hard heart has brought disgrace, not upon Moses, but upon the Lord. 
Suddenly, aware of their sibling bond, Aaron begs Moses to pray to God for healing for their sister Miriam, and Moses does. And then the Lord answers Moses' request to heal Miriam with a very interesting reply. If her father, her earthly father, whose name was Amram, if, if her father had spit in her face, would she not have been in disgrace for seven days? Her earthly father was also Moses' earthly father, as well as Aaron's earthly father. God is taking the role of father in this family dispute. As king, God desires that the, the kingdom, think, think culture, reflects the heart and majesty of their king. And as a father, the Lord disciplines his children to form character out of his great love for them. In the wake of this incredible family rift that is beginning to form, God takes on the role of father. Does this passage hold any value for the church today? I offer two applications from this, both of which stem from God's heart as our Heavenly Father. First, if you are listening to this this morning and this family drama seems to resonate with you, I encourage you, pay attention to that. I think we can all admit and agree that, that family is messy, but family is also a gift. Have you allowed jealousy, resentment, entitlement to take root in your family? This will erode your witness as a Christ follower. I'm not talking or suggesting that we need to be perfect. Rather, I am simply offering up and suggesting take a posture of humility. If you have been carrying around bitterness and conflict within your family, I encourage you to deal with it. Stop sweeping it under the rug. Stop casting blame and shame on one another and clothe yourself with humility. Second, we often use language in Christian fellowship that describes the church as family. We, we do regard one another as, as brothers and sisters. Our favorite title, in fact, for the Almighty God is Father. Jesus encouraged this, even implying greater intimacy with God by using the affectionate Aramaic term, Abba. If that is true, what kind of family are we functioning in within the kingdom of God? Does jealousy, resentment, or entitlement creep into our fellowship at First Covenant Church? And how about more broadly? Why is so much of the, Christians, the Christian church still separated along racial, ethnic lines? Why do black, brown, and white Christians in America remain so divided in our fellowship? If Jesus is the head of the church, then, then why all the division? If we're all focused on Jesus, surely it can't be Jesus who is dividing us. I firmly hold to the conviction that the Bible is meant to be read and applied in community. To that end, the Lord has given humanity a beautiful diversity. The Holy Spirit guides us in reading and, and rightly applying the scriptures when we consider it from the point of view of others. This is why I, when I read, I, I try to read from a wide variety of theologians. I want to Try and see the text through their eyes, their experiences, and not rely merely on my own. We recently, this last Thursday, have made available to you through the church app uh, a wonderful devotional entitled Bless in Living Color. As I said, you can get this through the church app, and it's, it's created in cooperation with the Covenant Church, uh, their Make and Deepen Disciples program. And it's simply an encouragement to think about having faith-filled conversations with people who aren't just like you? How can you begin to pray for and to listen well and to engage and entertain and be in fellowship with people who are different than you? And in doing so, I believe that that will enrich our faith community. Well, maybe racial divides seem just too out of touch with our little community 
here in Wilmer, although I would strongly argue otherwise. Maybe you look with envy at the church down the street as they add a big new addition to their facility. Maybe you hear from a neighbor of the exciting new program their church is starting up. And not wanting to be outdone, you suggest to your pastor the next time you see him that uh, we should do something like this too. Usually that implies, pastor, you should do something like this. Or the other side of the comparison game. We hear how another church in town might be struggling. Well, do you join with your Christian brother and sister in mourning and earnest prayer? Or do you encourage them to jump ship and you can come and sit with me in my pew? Too often, we see our Christian siblings in the kingdom of God as competition. We highlight the differences, scrutinize one another's piety, but fail to love one another as brothers and sisters. The number of non-believers in Wilmer, it's not decreasing. It's on the rise. There are fewer disciples of Jesus in our community than, than we had 10 or 20 years ago. There's plenty of work for Christians in Wilmer to be doing in advancing the kingdom of God, all for the glory of God. Yet too often, like Miriam and Aaron, we allow jealousy, resentment, and entitlement to take hold of our hearts. We become preoccupied with, with retaining or gaining power, authority, and privilege. We forget our call as family to be stewards of God's kingdom. And that is when, when I lose sight of my identity as a steward of God's blessing in a broken world. When I lose sight of that, I inevitably resort to being a consumer of Christ's church rather than a participant in God's redemptive work in the world. Is the church a family or not? There is so much beauty and strength and so much enjoyment in understanding and recognizing and seeing ourselves as a family. But that's also work to be a family. Each and every one of you is joined together as First Covenant Church because the Lord desires to do His will in and through you in advancing the kingdom of God all for the glory of God. We do this work as a family, the family of God, with born-again believers of every ethnicity. We join with other churches around us. The Apostle Paul recognized this importance in Galatians chapter 3. He says, And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. The Apostle Paul brings us right back to family identity. Family is central to our identity as Christians. The character of Christ is formed in the relationships we experience with our Heavenly Father and with our sisters and brother. Church, that we are a family of believers is a source of strength. We have a loving Heavenly Father who, who provides for our needs and also disciplines us in preparation for our future. God has given us sisters and brothers for the journey. Do not despise one another, but in humility, let us be transformed together into the stewards God has called us to be. Let's pray together. Holy God, there is so much from this passage of Scripture that, that can speak to your people today and in our time. Lord, I believe that you are shaping us, preparing us to serve as stewards of your grace, mercy, and righteousness in our world. God, we in America have too often thought of ourselves 
as the center of your kingdom work. We have, I believe, wrongly thought of ourselves more highly than we are. In our arrogance, we believed it was our job to save the loss and establish the kingdom in places where the gospel was not known. And in doing so, we have forgotten that you always go before us and simply invite us to follow you. Holy God, in many ways, we feel that Christianity in our nation is at a crossroads. And rather than unite as sisters and brothers around the common cause of the gospel and shared baptism of repentance, we have instead tried to devour one another. Lord, I confess that we have allowed jealousy, resentment, and entitlement to take hold in our hearts. We have too often treated our fellow siblings as enemies. We have chosen to be defined by our differences instead of the one who unifies us, our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Oh God, of this we repent. Turn our hearts away from our own selfish ambition in vain conceit and instead focus our eyes solely on you, Lord Jesus. Tear down our petty walls of jealousy and resentment that we may encourage one another to trust you more. God, I pray for all of the churches here in Wilmer. Holy Spirit, unify us together under the banner of Jesus Christ that we, together, understanding that we are washed by his blood, we are called by his name, that we might be strengthened to do Christ's will in furthering of Christ's kingdom, all for Christ's glory. And finally, God, for those this morning listening to this sermon today whose, whose family rift is much more personal, God, I pray for those for, uh, for whom brother has turned against brother or, or child against their parent. God, I pray for reconciliation. Lord, in your mercy, change hearts to align with yours, O oh God. Lord, do a mighty work of healing. Melt away hard hearts and restore those who are broken. As our loving Heavenly Father, we take our cue from you. As your children, we say, Abba, Father. Amen.
Again, I want to thank you for joining us today. If you have not yet downloaded the church app, I encourage you to do so. You can do so right from your app store. And when you're on the church app, I encourage you, take use of this Bless in Living Color devotional. Use it over the next uh, eight or nine days to explore what it might mean to begin to enter into a relationship and engage in conversation with those who you wouldn't normally maybe want to engage in conversation with. Be blessed by that as you are a blessing to them. And now, take this as your blessing in a reminder written by Peter to the church. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Out of the light of Christ, go and be that light in a dark world. Amen. Isn't God amazing? He delights in being our Father and invites us to love one another as sisters and brothers. If something from today's service is moving on your heart, or if you need someone to pray with you, then please take a moment and reach out to us here at First Covenant Church. Our staff would be honored to hear from you and pray with you. Maybe you were watching and listening this morning and you've decided that you want to follow Jesus. If that's you, and you would like to pray with me now to start your relationship with the Lord, let me invite you to pause this video, get into a space where you can pray with me, and let's go to the Lord together. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I confess that I have sinned against you either in what I have done or in what I have left undone. Please forgive me of my sins. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died on the cross for the sins of the world. And I believe that he rose on the third day and is in heaven with you now, Lord. I want to follow you, Jesus today and for the rest of my days here on earth. I commit myself to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. If you prayed that prayer with me just now for the first time, or perhaps you stopped following Jesus and are ready to start that relationship again, please let us know by sending a message to the following email address. We want to celebrate with you and provide resources for you as you begin this journey. You are not alone. If you are unable to send an email, please reach out to us at the First Covenant Church office, and we will have someone call you back this week. May God bless you all as you walk with him today and in the days ahead.